first of all, thank you to Paula for sponsoring the space and also for this one. And thank you to Dave Levin and Dave Schwalz for Mike Leon. And, 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 and Mike, yeah, where, where did he go? Twitter, no, where did he go? So he walked away, but uh, and Mike for helping us out. He escaped. Space. He's shy. <laughs> um, also, thank you to the Sound Network for sponsoring our meetup.com. Um, so next month we have an opening. If anyone knows anyone or is interested in speaking, and uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Ori. Cool. Thank you. Uh, well, yeah, welcome. So today is a little talk. I haven't given this ever before, so it might be a little rough, so bear with me. Um, it's called Get Knit and Grit. So I think there's a lot of stuff out there that is kind of introductory to Git, which is useful, but I think a lot of people still really kind of struggle to figure out how Git works and really use it successfully. Oftentimes we find ourselves like finding the one Git expert that you work with and like asking them lots of questions every time you find yourself in a, in a backed into a corner or something. So hopefully this talk will like shed some light on on things. So uh, my name's Ori Rawlings. You can find me on most internet things at Ori Rawlings. No surprise there. Um, I work at Agencia, which is the corporate travel brand of Expedia. Uh, they don't have anything to do with this talk. This is just a factoid about me. Uh, but one of the other things that I try to do when I have time, not very much anymore, but I try to volunteer with uh, an actual a port of Git and Go. So I've been learning a lot more about Git over the last year or so. So I thought it would be cool to try and like share some of that, that knowledge. Would that be like the JGit library for Go? Yeah, JGit is okay. a really okay. really popular uh, port of, of Git. It's used in a lot of places. Yeah, GoGit is fairly new. It's, in, it's nowhere, near, <laughs> nowhere near JGit. Or there's also libgit too, which is another uh, C implementation of Git that's very popular. So, is anyone not familiar with Git? Let's start there. Or maybe, maybe does everyone mind like raising their hand? And when I'm just gonna say stuff, and as soon as it doesn't apply to you, maybe like put your hand down, just so I can kind of gauge the room and see where we're at. So, so you've used Git on a project before. Uh, you've used Git for like a professional project. You. Uh, head of merge versus rebase debate. <laughs> so that's, that's actually not bad. Uh, you've, you've ever recovered uh, dangling objects in your Git database. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the, no, this is good. This is like, this is I think right where we should be for this. Time, so. so don't don't despair. Have we written history that was fun? Yeah. Yeah, Git is pretty powerful in that sense. Um, so yeah, we're all familiar with Git. It's like this fancy distributed version control system, and you can like everybody's got their own copy of this database of changes, and they can share those changes with each other. Uh, and it's really fast, which is part of why it's very popular. And of course, uh, like one of the biggest social networks on the internet for developers is GitHub.com, which is all based on Git, right? And I think looking back, we will very much characterize this era of like software development as people mainly creating Git data, right? Like all this era of computer science is all happening with people writing stuff and putting it in Git. Um, and actually Stack Overflow just came out with their developer survey from last year. And I think one of the very few technologies that really dominates in terms of market share is Git. Like, I think it was like over 80% of developers who respond to that survey have used Git, which is, there's nothing else in their survey in terms of languages or other frameworks that even came close to that kind of number. So. And in the room here, almost everybody had used Git, so. 
So there's this uh, nice quote from Fred Brooks uh, in Mythical Man Month. I'm just going to read it because I think it's a good quote. Show me your flowcharts and conceal your tables, and I shall continue to be mystified. Show me your tables, and I usually won't need your flowcharts. It'll be obvious. So this is kind of an interesting idea. I think it applies to Git, too. The idea is that if you know what the data structure is, if you know how the data and the, the information is organized, uh, you oftentimes don't really need the algorithms explained to you because you can imagine how the algorithms would look. But if you try to go the other way, if you're just trying to explain algorithms to people or get commands to people, and they don't understand how the data is organized, it's, it gets modeled really quickly. You don't really understand what's going on. So that's kind of the approach I want to take today. I want to delve deeper into sort of how Git is built more from the ground up. And then we might get into some of like how the algorithms and things are, are organized or how different features work within that data structure. So before I delve into Git itself, I want to take a step back. I want to talk about this guy. Does anybody know? Without maybe cheating by looking at the little. So this is a this is a computer scientist. He's kind of famous, I guess, in computer science. <laughs> His name is Ralph Merkel. He's uh, he's done a lot of stuff actually. So as an undergrad, he came up with this thing called Merkel puzzles, which we actually recognize today as one of the earliest examples of public key cryptography. Um, he also came up with the idea of like cryptographic hashing, which is pretty cool. And um, why he's relevant for our talk is he came up with this other thing called Merkle trees. So Merkle trees are used in a lot of or a lot of distributed systems, but they're they're a very nice uh, thing to build a distributed system around. So I'm going to try and explain them very briefly in my own terms, not in the terms he originally used. Um, so basically, if you have a bunch of pieces of data, uh, they each have a, a sort of content to them, right? It could be arbitrary data, maybe like a sequence of bytes. So what you can do is you can, you can hash that data. And when you hash that data, you get some kind of hash value. And then you can actually use that hash value to refer to that data, which is cool, because then you can have other pieces of data that have relationships to the first piece of data, and they can just use that hash value as sort of like an address to that other data. Now what you can do is you can start building up uh, data structures like trees. So in this example here on the screen, you might have some content here down at the bottom that doesn't depend on any other piece of information. When we hash the content for whatever is in that, that node, we get this 5716, whatever, whatever. And then later on, there's another piece of data that refers to this, this 5716. And it just does that by including in its own content this 5716CA value somewhere. And then. Um, we then hash all that content, and we get a new address for this, this new node here. And you can do this sort of recursively, right? And then you can build up these trees. And why this was interesting to Merkel was he was, my understanding is he, he was trying to find a way where you could like, sign messages, basically. But you could verify parts of the message without having downloaded the entire message. So you can, you can see here, if, if we have like uh, content here, and part of that content is maybe like a, a signature of some kind, then we know that we can recompute the hash of that content. And if the hash matches what we know the address to be, we know it hasn't been tampered with. And then we can recursively repeat that process all the way down and verify this whole subtree of objects below it. Does that sort of make sense? Did I lose anyone? And this is cool, because if there's other information that we haven't downloaded yet, 
we still know this part of the tree is valid. So in in your diagram here, which which uh, ovals come first, the ones? Yeah, so the ones on the bottom would be produced first, and then the ones above are uh, referring. They're like, they have links to those, uh, those objects. They have links, they don't contain, they don't have the full content, just the Yeah, all they need to the include book. is the hash. Because that hash is part of the, the contents that's being hashed yet again. And if, if that address changes, the hash for this object would change. We'll also change the tree. Yeah. Okay. And that would propagate all the way up the tree. Uh, yep. You can have multiple uh, nodes pointing to the same one. Like, so the base one there, you could have two. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, when, when Ralph Merkel originally described this, it was uh, described as like sort of a tree structure, right? But to your point, you can generalize this further. You could have two objects that refer to the same thing. And then you would get a, basically a directed acyclical graph instead of a tree. It's very similar, slightly more generalized. It doesn't really matter most of the time, unless you're trying to walk this whole tree or this graph. If it's, if it's not strictly a tree, there could be multiple paths to a single node, right? So then that's when you would need to use things like dynamic programming techniques, where you would remember what nodes you've already visited so that you don't recompute them, because then otherwise your time complexity of your algorithms would get really, really large. Yeah, so here's an example where like maybe we receive more content later, or maybe way in the future additional data was added to the original data structure. And it can refer to things that we already had lying around. And if you think about like how you would how you would sort of store this type of structure, it, it fits very nicely into any kind of key value structure. You basically would have a table where each row in your table has the content of a particular node. And then the key to that node, to look up that node, would be the hash. Does that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. like, a very, like a hash table, very similar idea, right? And then when you think about like this kind of operation where we're like adding somebody else maybe has additional parts of the data, and we're storing this in a, in a, like a hash table, a key value set, the merge operation here is really simple. It's just a set union. Right? We just, you have some nodes, I have some nodes. The new merge data is just the total set of nodes. Right? There's, no, there's no other kind of complexity to doing merging these. Uh, these this order doesn't matter. We don't care about order. We just care that these nodes exist, that we have links yeah. to these nodes. Yeah, exactly. And now we could like look any of them up, Ran like random access look up for any of these nodes would be typically important. So, that, so that this is really popular today in distributed systems, right? Git is based on this idea. Blockchains are based on this idea. In a blockchain, each of these nodes would be like a ledger of transactions, right? And a pointer to the previous block of transactions with some other stuff in there like proof of work and some other things. And then basically you can just build up a, a big long chain of transactions that have taken place. And you can verify that all those transactions are valid because the hashes all line up. And whichever chain is the longest, we trust. And if somebody's mucked with the data and changed something, the hashes aren't going to line up anymore. And we know immediately, even without downloading everything, that there's a problem somewhere. We can not trust that data. So yeah, so Git uses this to organize changes to files on your file system, which I think is a little bit hard to imagine how you would apply this. So so in in Git, there's Git has a has an object store. It's a Merkle DAG. And there's only four types of objects that get stores. 
which I think is actually pretty cool. This is maybe not immediately obvious. Four is like a, a fairly small number, and I think it suggests some elegance in the design. So I'm, I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. So a blob in Git is something in this uh, object store, and it? it's just file contents. So if you had a uh, Well, I'll, I'll go through the object types first, and then we'll come back and we'll show it in action and get. <clears throat> so if you had some file in your source code repository, right, you could just take the contents of that file, run them through some hash function, boom, you have an address. You can put the contents in some object store and address it with that hash. Very simple idea, right? Nothing like too mind blowing, I hope. The problem is, is that source code repositories are more complicated than just a bag of files, right? Files live in directories, and there's subdirectories of those directories, right? So what we can do, in, and what Git does, is you can create a new type of object called a tree. And the tree has a the hashes of some blobs that are contained in a directory, and then the name of the file in the directory. It's, it's just like a directory in a file system. <clears throat> so let me, I think this will be easier for me. directory, and I'm just going to create a git repository. So uh, it's pretty easy in git, it's like one command. This is kind of why I got started with git, because it was way easier to use than like setting up subversion for myself or something. <laughs> so, keep going. so if we, um, we could just make like a simple file, right? File and it just says hello, right? And uh, let's see if I can remember this again. So I think we could do something like this. So we could we could hash content that, that file, right? And if we changed uh, the file somehow. Right, we would get a totally different hash value. So it's not exactly what's going to happen with Git in a second, but we can sort of see how this idea is applied. So I'm just going to uh, start some Git history here. So I'm just going to say that I want to start tracking this file, right? And then I'm going to create a uh, commit to that file. And I just have a little program here that I'm going to run. We'll see if this works. So what happened was we stored the file, the greeting.txt file, in Git. And I got a hash that starts with 4EFFA1. Then there's a root directory for my project that contains that file, and it has a hash. And then I just created the first commit in the project. So the commit always refers to the root tree of your project. So, so if we look at this um, a little bit more closely, we can start to well, start from the commit window. So there is a uh, 
There's a command in Git, it's a really low level command. It's called cat file. And it's really just a way to like output the raw objects that are stored in Git. So you you wouldn't really use this normally unless you're trying to like write a script or troubleshoot something. So I'm just gonna say, hey, can we pretty print whatever that commit was? And what you can see is this is roughly the raw content of what that commit object looks like in the Git database. Can everybody see this, or is the text too small? So it, it's uh, this commit object is actually just plain text, which is kind of cool. And you can see here it's, it has a link to some some tree object, and here's the uh, here's the address of that tree, and that has some other metadata about who made the commit and when that took place, and then. When I did the commit, I said I gave it a message, so every commit has a message. And then when that, uh, the full hash is actually this long number. So that's cool. So, so we can actually tr keep tracing this down. So if we do get cat file of whatever the tree was. I'll get this other thing. You guys can see that for the spot. So, so I'm pretty printing this. This isn't actually how it's stored in Git. But this is a nice text format. But you can see it just says, "Hey, there's a blob with these file permissions called greeting.txt, and this is the address of that object." Cool. So we can keep going, right? We can trace this down. So if we do. We get the contents of that file that I added. So we can start to see how this might uh, generalize if we add other files. So if I uh, if I create a file, farewell, and then I add that to get. And create a new commit. And if I if I draw this again, we get a slightly more complicated tree this time. So now we have a new tree that has two blobs in it. Because now I have two files in my repository. And I got a new commit that points to that new tree, but it also points to the old, the last, the previous commit, so that we know over time how is this root tree object changing. So it's like very, very fundamental. So we can we can do the same thing again, or we look at some of these. see the commit. This is the new root tree, which is it's different than the old tree. And the picture showed that as well. It has a parent commit, which is the previous commit. It's got similar information as last time right? it says who made the commit when it happened. And then we can we can dig down again. So, so this is what the new root tree looks like. That's Sort of like a directory again. There's now there's two entries instead of one. Farewell. Dot text and greeting. Dot text. Yeah. Um, does it store the tree as an actual tree, or does it just have like a flat list of files? Like, is each subdirectory its own tree object? Yes, it is. Okay. So, <clears throat> is it, does this make sense? And then I'll jump into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that grab viz? Is that add-on you added? Yeah, it is. And uh, 
I'll get into sort of like how we do that. Okay. Because, yeah. So, yeah, so let's add another subdirectory, right? And then, uh, so we'll we'll create two files in that subdirectory. We'll add both of them. We'll commit them. this sort of backbone of commits with different trees hanging off of each of them. These are the root trees. And for the most recent commit, now this, this tree contains the two blobs it used to contain, but now it has this subtree, which is, to answer your question, it's recursive, so it, has an, it contains another tree. And now that tree has two objects. And we, we, can, we can look at these individually. So if we go back here, So you can see, it has the same two entries the previous tree did, but now it has a third entry. That's this address of another, now it's not a blob anymore, it's a tree. Yeah. And the file permissions reflect that as well. This is like directory permissions. And then this is hash of this. And it has a.txt and b.txt. And they have different hashes because they have different So I'm going to go back to the slides and we'll talk a little bit more about the different. Hmm. So we have tree, which is sort of this sort of recursive uh, way to refer to directories of files. And then we have commits, and we saw this a little bit already. So it has the root tree, we know that. And then it's got some other metadata about who made the commit, when that took place maybe a comment, what commits it's based off of. And then you can do other things, like Git allows you to sign that commit. If you have like a PGP key, it'll sort of prepare the commit, and then it'll do like a cryptographic signature of that, that content, include the signature in the content, and then that hash of all of it together is the hash of the commit. So you have like a verifiable with someone's public key, you can verify that they definitely trust that commit. As if you trust that person, I guess. I don't know. Um, so yeah, so the, so this this idea of a commit is useful, right? Because now we can. This is really where version control comes in, right? Not the trees and blobs don't really help us in terms of tracking how things change over time, commits really do. So now we can start to build up, you know, a, like a linear history of things, right? So uh, there's a fourth kind of object that I think at first you wouldn't really delve into right away with Git if you're new, but you can also have tag objects in your repository. So a tag is just a way to say that, hey, this particular commit's really important. Like it means something special, like it's like version one of my project, right? So let's maybe uh, delve back. So, uh, let's say like, we did all this cool work, Yes, this is version one. Cool, so now if we do this. 
Same. But if you don't put the tag in there at all, let's we'll just show that in the is a tag a tag thing in the tree. Uh, yeah, we could try, yeah, we could try that next. Yeah, it's perfect. Bug worker. Oh, actually, I know what the problem is. This this is where I was looking. So yeah, so this is exactly the same graph basically that we had before. Let me close these ones. Except now there's like a tag pointing to the top of it. So this is cool. So, so let's actually look at the tag. Cool. So this is just like, hey, I point to this object and it has the address of that object. That thing is a commit. is called v 1.0.0 and this is who tagged it and this is the comment for the tag. So this is this is really all the building blocks you need, right? For a version control system. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to more stuff now. But does does anyone have any questions on this before I move on? Is is this all new to people or is this sort of Vaguely familiar. Vaguely familiar. Cool. It's not, it's not new, but it's really helpful to see it visually and see yeah. it actually in the graph. Yeah. So, and then and your graph the screen, all those circles, what is the name for those? Is it an <coughs> item? Is it a, is yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, what is the terminology for this? So, I, I just, objects. objects, I think, is probably the most canonical way okay. to put these. I figured since you were working on code that you would have a very specific vocabulary. Yeah. 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 So so okay, so if we think if we think back to Merkle trees for a second, right? So we why is this useful for distributed systems, right? Git is distributed. So it kind of goes back to this nice property that these Merkle trees or Merkle DAGs have, which is if I have some copy of the database with all these types of objects in it. And you have some copy, and I want to get your changes. All I have to do is figure out what are the objects that you have that I don't have yet, and then union with what I have. Just I just need a copy of those objects I'm missing. I union them, and then boom, my new DAG has all the stuff in it. And if we're really if we're clever about how we do that, right, we can avoid transferring a bunch of objects that I already have. And that's part of where Git gets a lot of its speed from, is you can be very clever about negotiating, hey, these are the object hashes I already have. And you don't even need to say what the hash is, right? You just need to say what the hash is, because the hash doesn't change, right? It's a totally immutable concept, right? So if somebody else already recognizes that hash, it means they already have it. You have it. We both know we have it. I don't need to send it to you, right? Or you don't need to send it to you. There's something you're missing. Okay, cool. I'll send that to you. I do have a quick question. I think we we'll probably cover it directly. But the blob that we have in here, mm -hmm. especially with multiple commits, uh, that is actually the complete, let's say, file source from file at the point of the commit. It's not a difference or anything like that. It's yeah, it's, absolutely, okay. absolutely. And and I I will actually we'll actually go inside how Git stores this in the file system and pull it apart. So yeah, Git is mostly this immutable DAG structure, but there's a problem with this. Does anyone recognize the problem with this? Well, if you're doing just the blob of the entire file, um, are you doing line by line? Then sure, sure. Yeah. Well, so some of that can be handled by just how we encode the text in the file, right? So we can have. We have New line characters, 
if it's a Unix system or it's pretty traditional, we can break that content into, into lines and any other program that understands those new lines can break it apart for us. Uh, I don't know if this is so much with the system itself, but if you're doing distributed uh, editing, if you have multiple edits, then if you want to have, no, that's entirely, I was going to say, if you want to merge two different trees, uh, it gets complicated, but I, you know, I don't think that's what you're aiming for. Yeah, so, um, yeah, well, we, could, we could talk about merging briefly. One of the cool things, I'm going to go back to that image. So one of the cool things is like, if we have two commits and we want to merge them together, we, already, we know a lot of things that don't require merging, actually. Because if you have two root trees, if there's, any, if there's no difference at all between those two trees, they're going to have the same hash value. We actually don't have to look at anything. If the hash values match, they're already merged because they're the same thing. Typically, the root trees are going to have Why some difference just, somewhere, right? Do, do, if you were doing that, you would just delete nodes in the graph below a certain point and still have all the same data, except you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't have the, the ancestors of the history. Yeah. So, so that is that is one thing that we do have to do, right? Because if we want to be able to verify all the history all the way back, we do have to have a copy of all the data that's referenceable from one of these commits, right? Or from a particular tag. We won't we won't be able to delete anything from our object store because once something refers to it by its hash, we can't actually go reload that content and verify that hash is correct. It sounds like you just described a squash. Yeah, we're moving the yeah. smashing. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit too. It's slightly more complicated. Of course. Ba basically, this data structure is, is immutable, and you can only append to it. Let's see, there are some tools to do major cleanups or get rid of old history and stuff like that. Yeah, and, then, and this is sort of what I'm trying to get to now is this sort of thing is useful, but we don't always care about all of it, right? Sometimes we want to know s semantics about this stuff, right? So it can't be totally immutable, right? We need some kind of mutable aspect to get that we can like move around to, to create this meaning, right? So this is, this is what Git calls references. So references are just like labels to things in this object graph. So you would use a label for your master branch. All it is is the hash that's currently the commit for master. If somebody creates a new commit later, we just update the reference to point to the new commits. <laughs> this is the this is the mutable part of Git. Okay. Oh, so what you're saying is the problem with it being immutable is that if you wanted to download the latest commit, how would you know what the latest one is? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, if I go to like Linux kernel, right? Linux kernel, I can't ask it for the commit, the latest commit on the master branch because I don't know what it is, right? All I can refer to it as is the thing called master, right? And the thing called master then points to this hash and then now we can start negotiating. Oh, do I already have the hash? No, I don't. Okay. Well, which hashes do I have? And then we'll just transfer the stuff I'm missing. Yeah, so references, uh, they're just these very lightweight labels. So actually, I'm going to go back to this repository that we created. And up until now, I've excluded the references, even though I mistyped the uh, command several times. But we can see, oh. There's actually these references all along that were being updated. But currently, they point to this. And if we go make another commit, I'm actually not going to do any changes in this commit. It's going to be the same root tree as the last commit. We 
we now are pointing to a different commit than we were before. So before we were pointing to the same commit that the tag was pointing to, right? But now ref has master points to this other commit. And both of these commits point to the same tree. There's no, there's actually, if we did a diff, if we wanted to diff these two commits, we really don't have to do very much work at all. We just look at the two commits, they refer to the same tree, no diff. Well, we don't have to look at any files, we don't have to load any other objects from the data store, we're good. But the reason the hash is different is because the hash includes the commit message with it. Yes, right? and the time that I made the commit, right? There's, okay. there's a few pieces of metadata that have changed, that's why we do get a new commit. Okay. That's a good observation. Yeah. Yeah, so, so references, they have different semantics. So like, so all, in, typically you don't use the full name for references. Like when you're using the UI, you would just say something like master. But what really what that means is this longer name, refs, heads, master. And there's a convention for all of the, the references. So, so references, that's named is prefixed with ref, refs heads are all branches. And semantically, these things are, are allowed to move around pretty liberally, right? If you want to start development on a new feature, you might create a new branch and maybe refs heads feature A, right? And you can create three or four commits. You can change that reference three or four times. No big deal. There's... Uh, a, another convention for tags. So tags are ways to point to commits in our, in our uh, or point to objects in our data store that we actually don't, so semantically they shouldn't move around at all. Right? A tag, if, if we tag something as version 1.0, it should never change, right? If it's changing, that means somebody's like mocking with what we said an official version was. So the reference itself is still mutable. It's just by convention that we don't change it. There's nothing really that restricts that. And what I did previously is I created an annotated tag. So are people familiar with annotated versus lightweight tags? Don't worry, because we're going to go into it right now. <laughs> so I created the annotated tag. And, and what it did is, is, is it created that tag object. But we don't really need the tag object, right? We could just say, like, We could just say, okay, so this is still a tag because it starts with refs tags, but it just points directly to a commit. We don't need that intermediate tag necessarily. And by convention, we could just make sure we never change this reference. That's, that's just a lightweight tag. So like when you run git tag, by default, it creates a lightweight tag. If you want an annotated tag, you have to do what I did earlier, which was you have to give it a flag that says, oh, I want an annotated tag. And, that, and that's, the annotated tags are mainly so that we can have a place to put the signature well, that says, yes, this is a really an important version of the project, and you can trust me when I say that, right? Because I am Linux Torvalds, for example, and this is a real version of the Linux kernel. Right. Nobody's, nobody's <coughs> modified that and snuck some you know, back doors into your copy of the Linux kernel or something. So those are the two sort of main types of references. There's another one that comes up a lot. So if you're using, if I'm sure you've all used yet with, uh, you know, where you're pulling and pushing changes to some kind of remote repository. Well, we actually want to keep track of, like the last time we talked to that remote, what were all the branches and tags that it had? Or what were all the branches that it had? And what did it point to at that point in time? The way we do that is we actually have references in our local repository that all start with refs remotes, maybe slash origin, if we call that remote origin, and then whatever all those branches are, what they point to. 
And then there's other there's other types of uh, references as well. So like your repository always has a head reference. And this, this actually looks a little weird in this picture, right? Because head is not pointed to an object. It's pointed to another reference. So there's actually two types of references. You can have symbolic references, like head. It just, it's a reference that points to another reference. Or you could have like a traditional reference that points to an object. So if we look. So if we look into so so there's this command's not so important, but basically it's just it's figuring out ultimately what object each of the references in our repository point to, and just printing them out, right? So. Now we'll just look at the real database. So all all the all the refs are here, right? So it's same same exact name, right? Refs heads master, right? Oh, all it is is it's a hash. There's nothing else in that file. Very very simple, very lightweight. It's very fast to change these, right? It's like a forty character uh, text file. Um. So let's look at it, the symbolic ref. This is a different format. It's not hash anymore. It says ref colon and then the name of some other ref. It's very simple. So I don't know. Let's play with this a little bit, maybe to drive the point. Yeah. Why? Why do they? Uh, why does Git have symbolic references instead of just um, pointing ahead to the latest commit? Is it just so that it doesn't have to update as many references whenever you do a commit, or? Yeah, so so head, um, so head, it, it has a slightly different semantic, right? So in your in your project, you can have multiple branches, right, simultaneously. Yeah. But you've only, you're only working on one of them, right? Only one of them is checked out, one of them is working on it. So we have to have a way to answer which branch is currently checked out. So that's why we have this idea of a symbolic ref, because whatever the, the head is, the thing currently checked out, right? And we just know, okay, it's this particular branch. Because when we make a new commit, we need to update not just head, but also the branch that we're working on. So we need to know which reference we're gonna be updating when we do that. Okay. That's so, what makes so. sense. Yeah, so if you want to answer the question, yeah, if you want to answer the question of what branch are we on, that's how you answer it. Um, okay, and that's what it, whenever it says you're in a detached yes. head state. <laughs> that right? Right. Yeah. Yes. I just, I made that too. Yes. <laughs> let's, let's do that first, actually. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to do, I'm going to do, that. I'm going to be very reckless. I'm just going to edit the repository. <laughs> no, let's see what happens. Oh, um, it says not currently on any branch. That's pretty cool. But I think I could still make a commit. Consider yourself to do It's working. And actually, my prompt, I actually have, uh, my prompt is set up so that it tells me what branch I'm currently on. You can see it's actually a little confused, maybe, at the moment. It's, uh, it's smart enough to know that it's like, I don't know. It's, it's on a branch, which is just some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just some hat. <laughs> That's weird. So let's, uh, let's see what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so this is kind of cool, actually. The head is just directly to this thing that no, none of the branches are pointing to. <laughs> the detached head mode. So, yeah, this is this like crazy detached head mode. But it's, it's really actually not that, not that crazy, is it? We could we could fix this. I'm just I'm not even going to use the commands. We're just going to we're just going to fix this. You are the Git implementation. Oh, oh, that's oh, not you did. So there is a there is a command called the red parts, and we might go into more later. 
but it basically takes some way of identifying some object, which could be like a branch name or a short branch. Name. There's actually a whole syntax so you can do all their stuff too. But I'm just giving it a prefix of a hash, and it knows how to figure out what, what the full hash is. So that's why I'm using it here. So let's do. So this is this is getting better, I think. Now, now we have a real branch that's like pointed to the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. We'll just check that out now. <clears throat> and that, sh that should update head to point to. Oh. I could have gone and changed head to be like ref colon whatever whatever. That's a little easier. So yeah, that whole scary detached head mode. That's like all it needs. It's it's not that scary because again this. The DAG is immutable, right? So if, if we're in detached head, we accidentally create some commits. The commits are there, they haven't gone anywhere. We just we just aren't referring to them in any way. The trick is just reestablishing that reference somehow. So you know, I could have also just done well even just this. And even if I was in detached head mode, the first the first commit in my log would have been that commit, and then I could have just copy pasted this. I could have checked out master for real, and then like changed master to go to that commit. Right? So, so the other thing I wanted to like we could play with symbolic <laughs> references a little bit. Right? Like we could be like. Mm. So let's say, so we created foo, which is a symbolic reference to a branch called bar. Is a symbolic reference to food. So what, so what does this look like? Yeah, they're just, they're just like up there. We couldn't do anything useful with those. If we try to like check it out, it's gonna probably. Does that happen though? It's like I don't know. This is really weird. Basically, what you're saying is you're not careful. You can really muck up the machinery underneath. I think, I'm, I think I'm kind of trying to say the opposite. It's actually like the machinery itself is pretty simple and, and all the stuff we really care about is in this immutable store. So it's really hard to lose stuff and get frankly. It's, it's more what I'm trying to make. The real, the real complexity is we've just forgotten what it was that we made, right? That's the trick. Like we just can't remember what, how to call it by some name. And that's why a lot of the git commands, when they're doing things that might be like destructive, they output some kind of hash. So if you're like, oh shit, that wasn't what I meant to do, you can copy paste that and like create a new branch from it. So you can you can get back, okay, there's something referring to it, and now we can get back to where we're going. So I'm gonna Does anyone have any questions? So that <clears throat> command there just shows that when you like delete the branch, it just goes and zaps those files because it really had nothing to connect those files to anyway. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and we, we and did. So just it didn't the bother stopping and checking that that was pointing to anything legit or not. It just blew the branch. It, yeah, I mean, we could do, we could do. I think that's all it does anyways. That's what I'm saying. Is, 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 yeah, it doesn't believe. really. Yeah, yeah, we could. I mean, we can do other stuff too. Like, whoops! I deleted something important. Uh oh. Um, yeah. And, and all that's happened is that reference went away. <clears throat> Are you using an example of actually versioning but one I'll, of your source files? Oh yeah, we could do that. We could do that. I'm a, I'm actually going to start over with like a new repo because this is getting a little cluttered. Is that is that okay if I yeah. if I do that? I'll do it. 
I mean, it's up to you guys. We can do it. No, no, no. no. no I just got used to this one. Yeah, no, we'll, <laughs> stay, we'll stay with this one. We'll stay with this one. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> scroll-orama. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let's see. Whoops, we had a bug. We were supposed to say hello, world. Uh, uh, the boss is mad now. <laughs> you didn't write any tests. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I actually do, I don't have a testing framework for text files though, so I have to work on that first. But I'll come back to it, I promise. Um, so I'm gonna say like any self respect developer use world. Okay. So let's let's see how this looks if we have trouble figuring out what the hell happened. Um, so we got a new commit from what we had before. It points to a different root tree, which makes sense because one of the one of the objects somewhere in that subtree somewhere changed. So we're gonna have a new hash all the way up that Markle tree, right? And and what that means here is we're just appending new objects to the overall tree. The old root tree is still there; it hasn't gone anywhere. We just are creating new content always. It's a pen-only data structure. Again, it makes it useful. Later on, when we're distributed, we're trying to merge different repositories. It's just unioning all those objects together. To a pen-only data structures, the final un merge is a union. So wait, ben, can you find the blobs of data inside of the docket directory? Yes, yes, I'll, I will get to that next. I want to make sure that kind of the data structure conceptually makes sense, and then we'll get into sort of specifics of how it's implemented. Okay. So those, yeah. that, uh, in that bottom tree, those those two uh, yeah. blobs are... <clears throat> so so, no, so both of these... They have to be so these, two, these two root trees, they, they both have a common subdirectory that we didn't change. Right, so and you can see that we point to the same tree still, because that tree hasn't changed. Which is cool. If we're diffing this commit versus the prior commit, we have to diff all the files, right? Mm -hmm. But we're as soon as we look at like, oh well, the hash for subdir right. is the same because a, it means I don't need to text, load any of those a files. A text and b text didn't change, and you didn't yeah. add or delete any files. Exactly. We know that whole subtree hasn't changed, so our diff can be really fast. We can just skip over anything. Like we don't have to do anything. We know we're not going to be rendering any changes. So, but by this graph, it's not easy to tell uh, which blob is the ancestor of the one. Yeah, and that's just like the way this is laid up. Yeah, but I mean. I just made this for the presentation. <laughs> this isn't, like, I wouldn't recommend this as a really like, tool for understanding what's going on. But, but getting your point, you're right, because the blob on the left, I'm assuming, the, yeah. the, is our new file. Yeah, so he, here's, the, here's the original hello exclamation point, right? Because that was referenced from the first commit. And you can see the the previous commits also was referencing that, but the new commit doesn't, or the new root tree does not. It doesn't. Yeah. So that's that's the new block right there. Right? But, so you, we, but you don't know that those two yellow guys not by their graph to but, each other. Yeah. At least in that view. I think that conception in this uh, the blobs aren't actually aren't actually related to each other because it's storing the entire file. Yes. And I think actually when you're downloading a Git repository or getting new content from it, when it says it's fetching or calculating the delta, it's probably calculating the delta on the blob, like seeing what blob you have, getting the blobs that it has, seeing what the diffs are between those two blobs, and then sending you that diff instead of just the. But there are ways to find out the history of that blob. What what? Yeah. What the different versions were in that. I'm just looking yeah, at that graph, that, and that that's graph isn't really showing. It's an interesting that. question, right? Yeah. Because, like, like, so an like we might want to do get log, but only show me the commits that changed this particular file, right? Right. It's a common operation. Get log, reading it. We get two commits. We don't get all the commits. We know there's more commits than that total, right? If we did get log, we're going to get a bunch of stuff. So. If my Fred Brooks quote holds up here, we could probably guess how this is implemented now that we understand the data structure, right? So, so all we really have to do is 
we just walk through the commits. And at each commit, so we know this, this is the tree, right? Okay, so we know we know in the first commit we know what the hash is. So so that's that's good. The question is like this is just syntax means like the parent of head. So does the previous commit have the same hash? If it if it does, we don't need to include it in the log output, right? Because we know that file hasn't changed. If it is different, we know we would print this commit in our log, right? So I think in this case, oh, whoops, this is this. <coughs> okay, so, so this commit had 27C, C, this one had or EFFA. Okay, so we know we have to include this log, or this commit in our log. And then we would just step back to the previous commit, and until we get to the first commit in the project, these hashes don't change again. So we would skip all of those. So git log is really just like a filter commits that don't match certain conditions. It's actually not terribly complicated of an algorithm you now understand the data structure. And because it's all based on these immutable hashes, there's a lot of things we can assume without looking at too much information. It's very powerful, powerful data. I totally would assume, assume they had pointers to one another, right? You know, that you would know who your, your preceding yeah. file was, and you yeah. don't need to know yeah. that if you know the structure. Yeah, and I think traditionally a lot of version control systems have worked that way. Right. Yeah. There are some disadvantages to doing this this way, right? Like, you have yeah. lots and lots and lots of files, like things might start to break down a little bit. Um, yeah. Or if, if you work on a really big repository and you only work on a certain subtree of the, the source the source code, you have to check out all the files of all the things you don't care about. And that's why uh, you know large organization like Google, for example. They have a big mono repository. All their source code is in one source code repository. Git doesn't work so well for them, it turns out, because it's hard to just check out part of the part of the tree, make changes, and then push that back up. Microsoft has done some work possible. around that because they're hosting Windows on Git now. Yeah. You know, they've done whatever so you don't the whole tree. Yeah. Yeah, and a lot of a lot of the work that's been done in the last like two or three years on Git is really focused on scaling. It's a really large repository. Cool. So, so conceptually, it, does this sort of make sense? This data structure? Because if so, we can start to delve into like, well, how does Git actually implement this? Yeah. All right. So somebody did mention like moving a file. You can do git mv move file from here to there, but it just would create a new commit, which is the reference. The tree would change the new path in it, or maybe two trees, right? And just piece of the I, I think under the hood, it deletes the old file and creates a new one that it copies it. No, you can't delete it. Not, no, 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 no. Wait. So let's, let's try. Not deleting let's try it, but it, it doesn't. It, it, okay. it's the same. So if we want to move the file greeting to subdirectory, it is the same. What's yeah, a file better change name for greeting? It creates a new file. Files. Or move it to subdir. Change the oh, sure. We do new greeting. Yeah. 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 Well, I'll do new greeting because it's a little bit simpler to put okay. it in. Is that would suggest the name of the file is part of the hash. Oh, this is interesting. But is the name of the file part of the hash? We know it's not, right? Because when we when we when we looked at the blob, the blob was just the content. It didn't have the name of the file. The only thing that has the names of the files are the trees that refer to them. So the trees will change, but the blob will be the same. Yeah. So this is our theory, right? Let's confirm. A move would create a new tree object. Yeah. <laughs> this graph is getting ugly now, but. 
all the oh my god. The interesting thing here, so ah. so there's no new blobs actually. Right. Right. This this tree and this tree both point to the same blob still. So. Yeah. Yeah. But we have a new but tree. Is, is there there actually they they have so different metadata yeah. though. They they actually still point to all the same mm -hmm. stuff. Because right. the files are the same, just the locations yeah. are different. Yeah, just the hash. So if we look at a look. So if you move a file, you shouldn't edit it at the same time. Ooh, this is interesting. No, not <laughs> yeah, it does. It does kind of make things easier for your colleagues, doesn't it? Yeah, but you can do that. You can do that file, because then there's. It's just a new but then it would. It doesn't. It would make What's interesting though is some some languages don't like it when you do this. Like Java, Java files, you can't yeah. change the name of a file without changing the content. Of the file. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Because the package changes. So don't use those languages. Right? <laughs> <laughs> They're going to mess up your They're going to mess up your Git. Right, just use the first <laughs> well, how does how does it um how does it keep tra track of then like does it just lose all the like Git name history or does it lose the history for that file the fact that it's been renamed or does it or does it have some other way of figuring out that it was an old file that you moved? I think it just becomes a new file that edited. Yeah, so we'll get, get blame. I actually don't know what get blame is. It, there, are, there are things like get blame that might have trouble following that file. I think there's a lot of like heuristics built in to try and like keep up and, and make I've that. I've played with some big uh, merge conflicts and uh, Things we had a we had a very very large project where we had a branch that went off on its own for a year and a half and then we yeah. tried to bring them together. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Okay. We actually um, had some. It, <laughs> what's that? It's not as unusual as you might think. Oh, I know. <laughs> but the interesting thing was I also found out that with common. the merging and it would mark certain files as this file was merged and they would be two separate files, but that had. A percentage of the content yeah. was the same, and it had yes. this algorithm that it kind of yeah. guesses. Yeah, exactly, and that—that's kind of the heuristics I'm talking about. Yeah, like, there's stuff that like people have been conscious of those problems, and there's yeah. there's a lot of cleverness built in to get to try and compensate. Yeah, so that's why I thought it yeah. would copy the file because I know at some point it does do that. If you make a significant move of a file and it changes slightly, it actually. We'll mark the one deleted and move the other one create it, but then it will call it moved in the commit. Yeah. And it had exactly. but it but it but it's slightly varied and it's yeah. 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 It's, so it's not I think straightforward. Like as a recommendation for git usage, if I would try to avoid combining in a single commit like renaming or moving files and changing lots of content in that file. Mm -hmm. You only change a little bit of content. Gets the heuristics and get are pretty good. So it can it knows that, okay, semantically this file moved and it has these changes. And when it renders diffs or you're rendering a pull request or something, it's a little bit clearer to your colleagues what happened. So, did, did you guys want to look at the actual? We kind of, we kind of got derailed here. We can come back and try to look at how the trees change when we move the fonts. We'll show that. So, so these are the most recent commit and then the previous commit. So these are our two trees. They have different hashes. So the, the most recent one has the file is called new greeting, which we expect because we definitely changed the name of the file. And the previous, the previous tree, I, the hash is the same. The hash hasn't changed. The only thing that changed here was the tree object. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or just cool. It's, it's a like we can be more efficient about how we store all this stuff. Is when things haven't changed, we don't need to create new objects. Very cool. And when you think about 
this is a useful property in general for source files because most commits only change a very small percentage of the files in your in your whole source tree, right? So we only need to store a few new objects for each commit. And that helps it scale to really long histories. Histories that go back many, many years, for example. Cool. So how are we doing on time, actually? No. We're good. Do we have to be done at a certain time? No. Yeah. I think 30-ish. Yeah, we're trying to wrap I'm going to wait until you guys boo me off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, how does Git actually store stuff? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a new, new Git director that's a little bit uh, less cluttered at this point. So, the first question we might have is, um, well, this is a totally empty directory. Uh, what happens right after git init? Hopefully git init does something. I mean, I run the command, right? <laughs> I don't want it to be doing nothing. It creates the .git folder, right? Yeah. Cool, so there's a .git folder. What the heck is dot .git? Cool. Well, it has, it has some things that look sort of familiar, right? It's got head. We saw head before because we changed that file. So what, what does it actually say right now? Because we know we haven't. We don't have any commits. Like if we do like get log, it's like arf. There's nothing in here. That's interesting. It says refs heads master, but we don't have a refs heads master yet. What is a refs head? We have refs folder. heads, but there's no master in there. Okay. Well, now it knows why we don't have any commits. Right? Hmm. Why? Why does it have a branches file? Yeah, that's actually good. I'm not going to go through all these because I don't know what the, all of them are. <laughs> I know what many of them are. So I'm going to focus on those. I'll leave the rest up as an exercise. <laughs> all, the, all the hooks and all the branches are stored. Hooks I do know about. So, so, so what I'd, I'd like to do pending time is we'll try to look at the how things are laid out in this .git directory. And then if we have time, I'm just going to throw up a bunch of random Git topics on the slides. And you guys, it's like choose your own adventure. Pick, pick whatever topic you want to know more about, and we'll try to go. So. So yeah, there's not much in here. We have refs heads, we have refs uh, tags, which we know conventionally those have specific uses, but they're both empty. There's nothing in there. Uh, oh, and we have this dot. We have this dot get objects. Object sounds familiar. That's a term we used before, right? To your question. So there's nothing in there now, but there better be once we start using this git repository. Right? So uh, let's, uh, I don't know, can't. So I'm sorry, I must have missed it. Did you make a new repository? I did, yeah. yes, sorry. New repository, starting, starting from the ground. We're gonna, we're gonna rock Silicon Valley with our new project. So, so, so I, I've added this new file, cat.txt with the content meow, because it's a cat. And we haven't committed anything. So what is what is what does dot get look like now? It knows we added an object. So Ooh, okay. We still don't have refs heads master. That makes sense, we don't need commits. But we do have the, we have this object process is pretty cool. So, thirty-seven. It's just it's just a directory. <laughs> oh, that's a that's a good question. It's not forty-two, right? Because it's not forty-two. That's why it's thirty-seven. Right? Yeah, it, it's a hash of the hash. So so let's see if this graph is. Uh, for, oh, this is useless. <laughs> this is useless. 
And it's actually because by default, get graph is, it walks all the references. But we don't have any. Our references don't point to any. Very fast. So, <laughs> so I have this nice little option in here so that it'll, it'll look at everything, including dangling um, objects in here. Objects or I had a feeling. Oh, look at this. This is pretty cool. What is interesting here, so we have, a, we have a blob. What is this blob? It better be meow. If it's not meow, I've been lying to you for the last hour and a half. And these are going to be really nice. Uh, I think dangling was a poor choice of words for that. It's really an orphan uh, object. So Nothing references it. It's an orphan. Yeah, Git uses orphan for something else. For something else. <laughs> just, just like check check out right, a branch. Just, right, and, just like and yeah, so many mean something completely different from subversion. Or anything yep. that yeah. came for us. So, so, and I, and I do want to take like a second as a, like a side. I think one of the things that makes Git challenging to learn, aside from not most people not really understanding how the data structure works, but there have been over the course of history, certain terminology has been overloaded. It actually means multiple different things. Yep. And it's actually so bad that certain commands do multiple semantically unrelated things. <laughs> like git checkout, you use it to switch branches, but you also use it to check out certain versions of files into your working directory. Right. And these are just like little mistakes that were kind of made mm -hmm. in the open source project. Like people just didn't think through the API design enough. There's a few other things, and we're actually going to get into it right now. Yeah. Index is another thing. Mm -hmm. So index refers to this file, right, that I've just created, but I haven't committed anywhere. Where does it live? It lives in the index. Which just actually aren't there three or four other names for index? Yeah. Staging. So they tried to, they realized that this was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, index is also used for something that we hopefully will have time to get to, which is uh, pack, pack files are a thing. It's another way of storing objects. And you need to build indexes for those pack files. So there's a lot of commands around, uh, you know, those indexes that are not this staging index. So they kind of went back and they're like, oh well, they added a new names for the same option. So if you do like get diff, you could say I think you can say index. I, I don't use it because I don't want to use the confusing term. Use a no index. Full index. Actually, so so the term I always use is staging. Yeah. Oh, it's a synonym of cached. Cached. Uh, so there's like uh, yeah. cache, index, and staged, and they all relate to like pending changes that haven't been committed yet. So, and I think this is like, this is some of the sort of fumbles and the get tooling that makes it hard to learn. I like stage the best as a name. Yeah, and I know you. I always use stage personally. A lot of the tools seem to as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it, like a lot of work has gone into update the tools so that they use like, more consistent terminology. A lot of the VS Code plugin and the source tree and all that talk about stage. They don't really talk about in depth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. One other thing that I don't know if you've observed this, but when you bring people over from traditional um, source control, like we talked about, the terminology is similar but behaves differently. Yeah. You know, like you go to Subversion and you're going to check something out. You log in and you check it out, which means pull it from the repo. And yeah. then you t try to explain to them, no, check out doesn't do that in Git. You yeah. pull it and you clone and you, and they're like, yeah. what? Yeah. yeah. And so it, I think the For biggest sure. one with checkout is, is, you know, people that come from those those legacy systems are like they don't understand that under Git it has nothing to do with authority. It has right. not, yeah. you know, you're not getting like in those other systems you have to have permission or you have, yeah. you can't check it out if it's busy and you get all these yeah, constraints. There's on. like locks right. on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 For sure. But, cool. Yeah. So let's. Uh, Let's refresh a little bit. What's intruding now? Okay, so so there's a few differences from before. 
I'm not going to scroll back up. I'm just going to state them, and you'll have to trust me. So there's there's this th directory called 37, okay, in objects, and then this other file in there that's got this really long name that seems like random garbage. And then there's this new index file, which is interesting. Uh, I don't know if this is going to be very useful, but we're going to try it anyways. So the index file is actually this binary file. And it's, it's a file that we update whenever we run git add. And we just say, like, oh, hey, uh, I created a new blob. And its file path is such and such. And maybe here's some other permissions about it. And it's all, it's all binary code. But you can see if we convert this to ASCII, you can see, actually, it's got cat.txt in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the commit. Oh, this kind of looks familiar, doesn't it? Mm. 37, 5D, 5C. Oh, OK. So maybe that's the hash to our, to our new block that we created. Oh, oh. Can we? Do this. Oh, no wonder. Okay, <laughs> this is starting to connect a little bit. Right. So, oh. first two letters of the hat. Mm -hmm. So what? What is in this? That's that's a pretty old technique to make yeah. sure your directories don't get too big. That's probably all it is. Yeah, exactly. Directory DB. Yeah, it's just a way to shard the the directory. Mm -hmm. You just take the first two uh, characters of the hash. So this is, oh, no, it's a binary file. <laughs> I like promised it was going to be this like simple like text file. It was just hashed. What, what the hell? Um, so I have, I have this uh, little program that I wrote. I'm going to show you the entire source code to the program. This is a little Go program. I think if you don't know Go, this is not going to be confusing. All it does is it uh, it reads standard in. It does you live the decompression on it and writes it to standard out. <laughs> you guys believe me on that? So can you Zcat file for us? Oh, Zcat you can't use. Because oh. Zcat assumes gzip, and gzip has a special header at the beginning to tell you what the compression scheme is. Get for goes that. We don't need those headers on all of our projects. <laughs> we know what we are. Those are way too big. Oh, those extra bytes. <laughs> well, I mean, I can't work with that we, will, we will have millions or tens of millions of objects, so it yeah, will add up, yeah, actually. Yeah, it's yeah, not, it's not yeah, uh, yeah, negligible. Yeah, it probably hit Richard Stone, so. So that's kind of interesting. So we got something. It's not just meow though. It's got some other crap. Blob, blob five. 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 Five seems reasonable actually. Well, blob definitely makes sense. Because right? it's probably the type of this file. Five is the length of the content. Oh. A new line character. Yes. So, well, that's that's cool, but like, whoa! If we hash the decompressed content, we get the same hash as how we referred to the file. That's cool. Okay, so now we really understand how it's the object store is storing the data. Hmm. So it hashes the uncompressed. Yeah. When it writes it to disk, it makes sure it compresses it first. It's an optimization. Yeah. So all that other all the other file types, it's just a matter of like the schema of the content in this block in this object would change. If it's a tree, it's gonna have I don't know. It's binary, so we'll we'll show a tree in a second. But commits we know are text. So they'll probably say like commit, and then there'll be some number that's the length of the, all the commit data, and then it'll just be the commit data as text. So let's let's create our first commit. So 
tool. We can do this again. Let's take a look. Oh, this thing has Russ Hudson Master now, which is interesting. And it's got this tree and a commit that we didn't have before, right? Before we just had that. Now we have this. The so blob is the same. Head now points to something, so let's let's take a look. Uh oh. So I'm gonna scroll up a little bit. So ah, new. Yeah, we get a bunch of new stuff now. So I think uh, I think the index should be empty. Because everything that was in there should I don't know, it's got it's got the stuff that was still in there before. Alright. It didn't clean that up. But uh, we do have these new objects, right? So this BF and DC stuff, which yeah, yeah. okay, that matches up. Let's let's take a look at the commit first. Oh wait, and we have ref head refs heads master. Mm -hmm. We kind of saw this before. But we also had some new the uh, reference tags at the top. The, now, if you go back to the folder structure. Mm -hmm. What do you want to look at? The, the very top was uh, oh. commit edit message and merge RR. Mm. Yeah, I don't know what those. I think the edit message is where it, like, when you're writing there, yeah. commit it. If you can't, it'll it's kind of see your initial commit. Yeah, it, it might be. It might be. Not mm. Yeah, so it does have. Put it and it and it's uh, yeah I think it's largely because like if I just you know normally if I did something like this mm -hmm. if I'm editing this it's got to save it somewhere before it actually builds the commit so right. I think that's yeah. what that's used for I'm not gonna... mm -hmm. I don't know I think I updated the commit so this is probably gonna look weird. Oh. No, no, it didn't change. Cool. So. Um, oh no, it did change it. So when I did, a, I, when I amended the commit, the timestamp changed. Yeah, the timestamp on my. Even though you're cancelled out of it. Yeah, I think that's just because well, they get told the way they work. But Wait. it's it's not a video. We'll, we'll just render the whole thing, right? Have this but, but now you have you have four hashes there. We they, do. Yeah. Oh, they, okay. could, they could be a function of your it operating system yeah. because timestamps vary between operating systems. Like if, if, if it's looking at an act, there's an access or create, Linux doesn't have a create timestamp. just has an access and a timestamp for metadata change. Yeah. Well, and in this case, the commits will actually look different. But you can see here, it just left this commit out here dang. <laughs> When I amended it, it didn't delete anything. It just created new content and points to the new content. So if I'm like, hmm. oh my god, why did I amend the commit? Oops. I'm just going to do this. Names aren't important. But I basically am just. Switching back to the original. Ah. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't. <laughs> there we go. So I'm back to the original. You squint really hard. Those commits are dancing man. That's what I That's cool, right? I mean, yeah. I didn't lose anything. It's like, Git is actually really safe. I mean, if, you, if you're comfortable with this data structure, if you're comfortable. no matter how you know, off in the weeds your colleague is on, like, I have no idea what series of Git commands he ran. You can always help them get back. I can only do if I can make that picture. Major ones for the 
Yeah, so, so let's let's actually dig into the, these objects, right? So if I if I do the do this. So the, the blob isn't too interesting. Let's look at the commit first. So this is the latest. Oops. Objects. So okay, so I I didn't lie before when I said that the commits were text format, right? It's got the little header still that says, hey, this is type commit, and the length of this content is 187 characters. Which should be if somebody wants to quick, real, real quick count up all the characters here. <laughs> but it's got, it's got the address of the tree. This actually looks really similar to when we ran git cat file, right? All git cat file did was it pulled the header off and just printed the rest of it. Question. Yes. How does it know where the number ends? Like it says 187. Oh, button. yes. So the, this is a good question. Like null byte up here? Text on for the. <laughs> yep, so there's a null byte right there. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's, not it's like a C file. Yeah. That was a sec. Yeah, we'll see action going. Yeah. And of course, my terminal doesn't care that there's a null character in the middle. It's just like, nah, I don't print. Moving okay. okay. I'm just going to keep printing stuff until I get to the end of the Cool, so. So let's look at the tree. So if we do. Oh, shouldn't have done that. Uh, so this, this is not going to look nice. This is binary. So, so get represents the trees as binary, which is a, it's actually I think kind of a weird design decision because a lot of stuff is encoded as text, but then trees are binary, whatever. Maybe it was important for performance or something. But uh, I don't know. We, we can. This looks very similar to what we had before uh, when we did cat file, right? There's other commands you can use to render this binary tree nicely. But if we go back to the zlib decompress, we see, OK, again, it's got this little header on there that says, it's a tree, it's got 35 characters, and then this first thing is the an ASC, like, ASCII representation of the file permissions, which we can see here. Yeah. Could it be that it stores the tree in binary because uh, file names can be arbitrary strings? Um, yeah, that, that could be part of it, yeah. yeah. I, I don't, I think a lot of file systems or, I mean, Git is designed to work with maybe file systems that don't even exist yet, but a file system could conceivably let you have things like new line characters in a file. Right? Yeah, I don't sure. recommend that one. <laughs> no, no, I don't recommend that either. We can, we can imagine it, right? And we don't want Git to break just because the file system does something weird or lets you do something weird, or somebody wants to use it the way it allows it to be used. Right? <coughs> So that's kind of cool. So this is this is most of how Git stores the data, right? Nothing too crazy. So if we if we want to like fetch changes from somewhere else, we would just figure out what objects are missing and add them in this objects directory. So, let me go back here. So I know we're we've gone pretty long already. I think this is a good primer. There's a lot of other things we could go into. If there's any of these that are interesting to you, we could go in now, or we could stop. Or if there's something not here that you guys are interested in, you could throw it out, and I could try to improvise if I know it. If I don't know it. <laughs> Could, could I can you talk briefly on, on the booking and some of the capabilities of that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. 
So yeah, if we go back to that uh, repository. So, so there's this whole directory. And there's a bunch of files here. They're all they are all end in dot sample. What are these actually? They're uh, bash files. Bash mm -hmm. scripts. Oh, you guys are useless. Yeah. No, I just looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these are these are all scripts. So yeah, sometimes we want to extend the behavior of get, right? Like uh, it would be really cool if every time somebody did a commit, right, like right after the commit, I could send like a notification to somewhere, right? Because maybe, hey, my colleague, colleague, I have a new commit, right? And we could like send an email and email all of our. I see a lot of people refer to Git as a change management system. It, it's really at its core, it's a source code control yeah. system. It doesn't by itself have change management features. Yeah. And what I mean by that is, and this is where the hooks would come in. Um, if you're working in a large pool of, or you're working with say a thousand developers on one project. Yeah. Um, and, and I know the open source model doesn't, it isn't a good thing to look at, but if you were using Git in a corporate environment and you had a couple dozen programmers, okay, and the management's gotta keep track of what you're doing. So they would, you know, you might have some kind of ticketing system, yeah. uh, bug reporting, and what the hooks would allow you to do is say, so like you could put, the, as soon as a hook there, every time you check something out, that it would trigger that, and in, in that your bash script could go out to your your ticketing system, which is the change management, the management part of it, and say, this developer pulled, um, it's pulling this file, and now I'm going to ask the developer what ticket are you working on? Yeah, and it, you could, and then you can link all that stuff together. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah, you could. I mean, we use a prepare commit message for exactly that. Like by yeah. convention, our yeah. branches are named with a story ID, and yeah. we just pull that and put it into the commit message. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. But so, I, do I remember though? I thought the hooks were just local. They don't actually get swapped to origin to master to the origin. They're You're not right. part of the repository. They are, yeah. Because they're just this file in my local repository. This hooks. The so, only thing yeah. that we're transferring. Are the objects, mm -hmm. so you can't. Really and then we're the saying what the ref that. our reference. Everyone has to put the hooks. Have hooks in so local. Yeah, yeah, and, and there are the there are tools out there to help yeah. you kind of yeah. do that. Well, again, Git is for is developed for the open source community, which doesn't give a, you know doesn't care about a lot of that stuff. And, uh, yeah. Like you know, back in the day when SCCS was your chain, your uh, source code control system. Um, like at Bell, Bell Labs was kind of where that came from. The tools wouldn't even let you get out of out of the water without what was called an MR, a, a modification. I used Sublime in the 70s. Yeah, so I you, know, uh, you, you have to, you know, and you couldn't even get to the tool without it, without giving it an MR number. So Git is like the wild, wild west. Do whatever you want. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, for sure. There's there's still somebody somebody else's job way downstream to decide what's what to merge into the final branch. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and another reason why the hooks are just private, right, is just because you like clone a repo from GitHub, you don't want to automatically execute code whenever you run Git commands. Because like I don't know, maybe somebody like has a rootkit in the hooks of that repo. Right? <laughs> That's not a good thing. So. So yeah, uh, you would have to like explicitly set them up on every time you have a copy of a repository. But you can hook in all sorts of behavior, and they all they all work. Basically, the various Git commands will just fork these processes up. So you can make it like a symlink to some other binary. Or it could be it doesn't have to be a bash script. It could be any kind of executable file. It'll get run. Then environment variables will be set a certain way. The parameters that are passed into that command will be Follow a certain convention, and each each of the the things you can hook into have different conventions for what they're going to set up. But then you can use that information to drive whatever behavior you want. Like if you you might install 
on the actual like where you host maybe sort of centrally the, the canonical Git repository for your team, right? You can install hooks there that link. You know, every time right before they receive commits that somebody's pushing, they run some kind of verification on them before accepting them. Like and the and these these scripts can exit with a non zero exit code and it to indicate, hey, do not proceed with whatever you're doing. So it's a, it's a very flexible way of extending Git with new behavior. You guys want to know more? Or let's go back to the back to slides. So one, one thing that kind of came up was this graph is command. Right? Mm -hmm. So how, how, how does Git actually do commands is an interesting question. So. So if I do git help dash a, I just say like, give me all that like, help about, I don't know what, but give me help for all stuff. One of the things it tells us is like what git commands we can run. But it tells us, oh, hey, these are the commands that I found in some directory on my system, which looks like where git is installed kind of. Oops, i go back to it. We have a bunch of executable files. Which a lot of them actually symlink back to Git. But it just checks the name on an exact symbol. But some of them don't actually. So is your graph is in there? It's not. So these are these are files that are actually distributed. Or these are subcommands that are actually distributed with the standard Git. Okay. But you can see they actually follow a certain convention, right? They're all prefixed with git hyphen. So on my path, I just have some other program that follows that same convention. And git will find it. It will just look up in my path. Hey, it does you know, git. It'll just know, okay, look on the path for something called git hyphen graphics. Why is this useful? Uh, it's actually really useful. So you may not know this, but git itself has uh, it, git itself has top level options. So you can do things like hey, before you run the sub command, change to a certain directory. This is running log not in the current repository, but some other repository. And there, there's other things that are sort of like common options that you might, it's sort of like functionality that applies to all Git tools. Yeah. You can put it in this top level command and it just sets up an environment before it forks that other execute. This is a really useful concept. Then the easy is actually having uh, having this sort of subcommand structure for CLI tools is really popular. Mm -hmm. But a lot of a lot of tools they just they just have a single binary, and you lose this you lose this ability to just extend it really easily and to move a bunch of common commands up into the, the top level command. Does that make sense? So like in the cases where all those other git commands just symlink back to git, yeah. it takes the, the name of the command and parses off of that to execute the command. But if you had placed some of these other universal parameters or options before the command itself, it finds those and executes them first before it then executes the command you gave. It. Yeah. Like in, in your case yeah. with the, yeah. the log and exactly. change the folder first and then. Yeah. So it gives you that point of intervention. Yeah, exactly. And the other nice advantage, so your not all the git, is, sorry. Oh, your graph is executable. You can use that, that same dash C thing 
yeah. uh, to change which directory it's doing it in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. This output's graph is format though. I've just been piping it into this thing that does the rendering and opens it up in the browser. But yeah, see, it's like all of a sudden that functionality, I didn't have to build that when I built graphics. So I get it for free. The other nice advantage, and this is especially true in a project like Git that's open source, because it's so easy to extend. There's, there's actually no rule that everything has to use the same languages. We can implement different subcommands in different languages. All, the only rule is they have to be executable. Right? So they could be bash scripts. C programs that could be Java. I mean, let's your, let's actually look at like. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, I think I can do this. So we go up. We can actually see that a lot of these subcommands, they're compiled executables, but like you can see some of them in here are actually not. So Git itself actually is implemented in multiple languages, right? Hmm. And it, it gives you that kind of flexibility, like. Well, I'm just gonna do this. Powerful idea. I actually use this. I have at work. I have a subcommand based tool. I actually use a similar strategy to this because it, it's it works very nice. We sort of a bundle of like different DevOps tools. A lot of them use the same language, but sometimes it's easier just to like have a small Bash script or a small Python script or something. We can have that flexibility. We can check them all in together. We can distribute them all together, and we can invoke them all with the same kind of root command. So, what did you write your tool in? Grab this. This this is in Go, okay. and I I use uh, Go Git because that's what I'm familiar with. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting idea, and it, it speaks to the legacy of how the Git tools developed as well. Because originally they were just like a group of shell scripts. It was just like. They didn't even really have a nice UI, I don't believe, to begin with. Is your graph is still just on your GitHub? It is, yes. If you are curious. So, could you pull up the Git history of Git? <laughs> yes, we could. <laughs> oh, well, not with graph. So, graph is, is a little slow. It's going to take a big project, I would. You know. It's not useful for practical use. It's, uh, I made it mainly for this presentation. But could we, do they like have the shell scripts part of Git, like when it was just shell scripts? Do they Ooh, have that? Yes, that's a good question. So I actually have, uh, so the Git project hosts a uh, copy of the repository on GitHub, uh, or like a mirror. You wouldn't contribute to the project this way, but you can actually seal the code. And there's actually, uh, in contrib, there's a lot of uh, like traditional kind of tr contrib projects, but there's also, I believe, there was one here somewhere. I thought they also had um, like old versions of, maybe it's not good. Are you looking at a different screen than we have? Oh, sorry. PowerPoint is the tree. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at uh, the source code. Um, 
Let me see. I have it local in this. Contrib examples. So I think in uh, contrib examples, they have older versions uh, of some of the very like core Git commands that eventually were ported to C for performance reasons. But they leave them around as shell scripts, so you can kind of see how it how it works. Um, and there's a bunch of uh, commands in here. Mm -hmm. So I think these these have all been ported to to see, but you can you can go into that. Oh, that was gonna be some early How did log use to work? I don't know. <laughs> 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 I stopped writing a child for about hundred lines. I think I can. Just a slow network connection. Yeah, yeah, so th this actually just uses another lower level command called yeah. oh, rev parse and then rev list. Which rev parse is just, I actually ran that a few times. It's, mm -hmm. it's just so you can understand what the argument that was passed in the command line, what the actual object is it refers to. And then you process that object somehow. In this case, rev list walks that tree. So, that uh, draw command, is it? Oh, yeah, I can show that. It's uh, a generic directed SLA graph tool or do other things. Uh, so, this is just a small shell script. All it does is it uh, creates a temp file. It uses graphs to render a graph, which if you're not familiar with graphs, it's, it's kind of an old Unix -E tool for doing uh, graph rendering. It's pretty cool, actually. I really did not have any experience with it before this presentation, or before preparing for the presentation. But it works really nicely for this. And it, you basically give it, um, uh, you give it uh, a list of pairs. Yeah, you sort of give it this textual description of a graph where you say, okay, these are the these are the nodes, and these are the edges between the nodes. And here's how you style the nodes. And then uh, this. Uh, so the tool that does that is called dot? Yes. It's another Bell Labs thing, just like yeah. uh, Sublime. It's the same vintage, you know, yeah. late, late 70s. Actually, yeah. I, th I thought it was actually called DAG. When I used it at Bell Labs, it was mm -hmm. actually called DAG. There's dot yeah. and dotty. Yeah, it's exactly. Like Graphis has a bunch of different commands depending on what the type of graph is in your command line gizmos. I mean we can we talk about other stuff too. I have a question. Yes. How is there any proposal in the Git community to try to update the data schema or the, the storage at all? Like maybe make improvements and or a process around that? Um, how static is it? <laughs> how static? Well, so backwards compatibility is critical, right? Right. right. I mean, for a lot of projects, they're already the, the database is already written, right? We have to be able to keep reading that. Otherwise, we lose the history of important projects, right? And we don't want to have explicit like migration steps that people have to go through to convert their Git data to some new format. So we're very conscious of backwards compatibility. And it's very rare that they ever violate that. Uh, sometimes they do have major revisions of certain formats, but they do it in a backwards compatible way where it describes that, hey, I'm the new version of the thing. And you can detect that, and then you can process it using the new format without breaking up older versions of the tools too dramatically. Um, but there are cases where changes do need to be made, right? So for example, when we talked about references, right, we talked about them as just all separate files under this .git directory. 
right? In each file, all it had was a single hash in it. Well, if we look at, uh, I don't know, if we look at Git project, right? There's not very many branches, but there is a, well, this maybe this isn't a good. If you look at like something like Linux, you know, there's gonna be lots of tags. Some, pro some projects have, you know, thousands upon thousands of references, right? And if you need to run some kind of operation that needs to figure out what all the references are, you don't want to be opening thousands of files. It's going to get slow pretty quickly. So at some point, they came up with this other schema of a packed references, which is basically a single file. We still have some of the refs expanded, but now we have this new file, packed refs. And this is sort of like, no, I don't know. Maybe I didn't do this right now. Maybe what's wait, what's, what's under objects pack? Uh, nothing. That's an empty directory right now. Huh. But it would store other stuff. Uh, Maybe it's not related to the thing. No, no. Okay. That's for. Hacking objects instead of references. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, oops. I think maybe you have to. Oh. Get back. Let's see if this gets. I only had one rep in this repo. But now you see it's more of a tabular format, and we could have many references listed in here. And especially for references that don't change, like by convention, tags don't change. We can keep them in here. We can, we can look them all up here, and maybe there's a newer version uh, in the on, like sort of loose references that is maybe uh, different. But for a lot of cases, this um, prevents us from needing to open many files when we want to know what all our references are. And when would you need to do it? So when you, when you go to pull changes from a server, the first thing that server does is it tells you what all its references are and what they point to. So you can imagine if you're a GitHub and you're getting you know millions of requests a day on each of your repositories, or, and each of those things, you have to list all the references. You want a more immediate way of representing that information in your Git database. That's faster. So, the, so Tansy, to get back to your question, they they do come up with new schemes of representing the information to solve things like performance problems. And they do it in a backwards way. And that's just part of, uh, There's. An, I don't know if, how formal the process is, but I mean, all their contribution happens through a mailing list. So somebody would be like, hey, I have this such and such problem. Here's a proposal for how we might do it. And there's some discussion and a series of patches. And then maybe it gets integrated, maybe it doesn't. You should probably think about uh, shutting down at yeah. some point. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. This was excellent. Yeah.